Section 3 of Self-Development and the Way to Power by L. W. Rogers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Helen J. An Iron Will The second requisite is a firm will. It should not be forgotten that an unusual and difficult thing is being attempted in which a person of weak will cannot possibly hope to succeed. Even in the ordinary life of the world, considerable willpower is essential to success. To succeed in business, to become expert in a profession, or to completely master an art, requires strong will, determination, perseverance. The difficulties in occult development are still greater, and, while it is true that any degree of effort is well worth while, the weaklings will not go far. Only those with the indomitable will that knows neither surrender nor compromise may hope for a large measure of success. Once the will is thoroughly aroused and brought into action, every hindrance in the way will be swept aside. The human will, that force unseen, the offspring of a deathless soul, can hew away to any goal, the walls of granite intervene. Be not impatient of delay, but wait as one who understands. When spirit rises and commands, the gods are ready to obey. Mighty indeed is this force when aroused, but a person may be easily deceived about his will. He is likely to think that his will is much stronger than it really is. He may say to himself, Oh yes, I will go through anything for the sake of the higher life and spiritual illumination. But that is no guarantee that after a few months of monotonous work he may not abandon it unless he adopts the wise plan of strengthening his will as he moves forward. Let him begin this by testing his present strength of will, but let him not be discouraged by the result. He should remember that whatever he lacks in willpower he can evolve by proper effort. To find out whether he really has much strength of will, a person may begin to observe to what extent he permits his daily plans to be modified or entirely changed by the things that run counter to his will. Does he hold steadfastly to his purpose or does he weakly surrender to small obstacles? Has he the will power to even begin the day as he has planned it. The evening before, he decides that he will rise at six o'clock the next morning. He knows there are certain excellent reasons why he should do so, and he retires with the matter fully decided. It is positively settled that at exactly six o'clock the day's programme shall begin, but when the clock strikes that hour the next morning, he feels strongly disinclined to obey the summons. It involves some bodily discomfort to rise at that moment, and he concludes that, after all, perhaps he was a bit hasty the evening before in fixing upon that hour. Whereupon he reconsiders the matter and makes it seven, and when that time arrives, he generously extends it to eight o'clock. The hour, of course, is unimportant, but whatever may have been the hour that was previously determined upon, the keeping of that determination is of the greatest importance, and the failure to put the resolution into effect is evidence of the possession of a weak will. Now all this proves that such persons have very little real willpower for they permit the desire for trifling bodily comfort 
to set their plans aside. Such persons are still slaves to the physical body, and weakly permit it to upset carefully outlined programs. They are not yet ready for good work in occult development, where real success can come only to those who have steadfast strength of purpose. People who fail to assert the will and bring the body into complete subjection probably little realise what a price they pay for a trifling physical pleasure. For until we voluntarily take the right course, we have not escaped the evolutionary necessity of compulsion, and may reasonably expect, sooner or later, to be thrown into an environment that will apply the stimulus we still need to arouse the will. It may be unpleasant while it is occurring, but what better fortune could befall an indolent man than to find himself in circumstances where his poverty or other necessity compels him to subordinate bodily comfort to the reign of the will? Nature provides the lessons we require. We may wisely cooperate with her and thus escape the sting. But so long as we need the lesson, we may be quite sure that it awaits us. All the business activities of the world are developing the will. Through them, will and desire work together in evolving latent powers. Desire arouses willpower. A man desires wealth, and the desire plunges him into business activities and stimulates the will, by which he overcomes all the difficulties that lie in his way. Ardent desire for an education arouses the will of the student, and the awakened will triumphs over poverty and all other barriers between him and the coveted diploma. If a man stands at a lower point in evolution, where he has not the ambition for intellectual culture, nor for fame, nor for wealth, but only the desire for shelter and food. Still, that primitive desire forces him into action, and while his willpower will be evolved only in proportion to the strength of the desire that prompts him, it must nevertheless grow. Instead of rising at a certain hour because the will decrees it, he may rise only because he knows his livelihood depends upon it. But he is learning the same lesson, the overcoming of the inertia of the physical body, albeit it is compulsory instead of voluntary. But all this is unconscious evolution. It is the long, slow, painful process. It is the only way possible for those who are not wise enough to cooperate with nature in her evolutionary work and thus rise above the necessity of compulsion. How, then, may we develop the will when it is so weak that we are still the slaves of nature instead of the masters of destiny? Willpower, like any other faculty, may be cultivated and made strong. To do this, one may plan in advance what he will do under certain circumstances, and then carry out the programme without evasion or hesitation when the time arrives. His forethought will enable him to do this if he does not undertake things too difficult at first. Let him resolve to do at a certain hour some small thing which, in the ordinary course of his duties, he sees is necessary, but unpleasant, and then firmly resolve in advance that exactly at the appointed time he will do it. Thus fortified before the trial comes, he will probably go successfully through with it. After once deciding upon the time, there should be no postponement, and not an instant's delay when the moment arrives. 
One of the things we have to learn is to overcome the inertia of the physical body. And many people are not really awake on the physical plane because they have not done so. To a certain extent, they are dead within the physical body, for it is a condition much nearer death than that supposed death of one who no longer has the physical body. The inert mass of physical matter in which such people are functioning leaves them only half alive until they have aroused themselves from its domination. They remind one of the lines, Life is a mystery, death is a doubt, and some folks are dead while they're walking about. This inertia of the physical body that so often renders people nearly useless is very largely a matter of habit and can be overcome to a surprising degree by simply using a little willpower. Everybody is familiar with the fact that it is sometimes much easier to think and act than at other times. But perhaps it is not so well known that the dull periods can invariably be overcome by an effort of the will and the physical body be made to do its proper work. An actor or lecturer, after months of continuous work, may find the brain and body going tired and dull. He may feel, when going before his audience, that he has not an idea, nor the wit to express it, were someone else to furnish it. Yet, by an effort of the will, he can quickly overcome the condition and change from stupidity to mental alertness and intensity of thought. The self is never tired. It is only the physical body that grows weary. It is true that it has its limitations and must not be overtaxed and driven beyond endurance as a tired horse is sometimes cruelly urged forward with whip and spur. Judgment must always be used in determining one's capacity for work. But that which is to be done should never be done draggingly with the inertia of the physical body marring the work. We should be fully awake instead of dead while we are walking about. If a person resolves to be the master of the body, he may soon acquire the power to arouse it to activity and alertness during all his waking hours, very much as one may acquire the habit of keen observation and be conscious of what is occurring in his vicinity, instead of being carelessly unconscious of the major portion of what is going on immediately about him. This matter of giving attention to the things that may properly engage the mind, and of using the will to arouse and control it, is of very great importance. Is it not what we call paying attention that makes the connection between the ego and the objective world? Giving attention is a process of consciousness. The person who fails in attention misses the purpose of life and throws away valuable time and opportunity. To give attention is to be alive and awake, and in a condition to make the most of limited physical life. Yet, many people cannot give sustained attention to an ordinary conversation, nor direct the mind with sufficient precision to state a simple fact without wandering aimlessly about in the effort, bringing in various incidental matters until the original subject, instead of being made clear, is obscured in a maze of unimportant details or lost sight of altogether. Such habits of mind should be put resolutely aside by one who would hasten self-development. The attention should be fixed deliberately upon the subject in hand, whatever it may be.
and nothing should be permitted to break the connection between that and the mind, whether it is a conversation, or a book, or a manual task, or a problem being silently worked out intellectually. It should have undivided attention until the mind is ready for something else. Perhaps few of us give to any subject the close attention which alone can prove its own effectiveness and demonstrate the fact that there goes with such steadily sustained attention a subtle power of extended or accentuated consciousness. When ten minutes is given to a certain subject and other thoughts are constantly intruding so that when the ten minutes have passed only five minutes have actually been devoted to the subject, the result is by no means a half of what would have been accomplished had the whole of the ten minutes been given to uninterrupted attention. The time thus spent in wavering attention is practically without effect. The connection between mind and subject has not been complete. Mind and subject were, so to say, out of focus. Attention must be sustained to the point where it becomes concentration. The mind must be used as a sunglass can be used. Hold the glass between sun and paper out of focus for an hour and nothing will happen. A yellow circle of light falls on the paper and that is all. But bring it into perfect focus, concentrating the rays to the finest possible point, and the paper turns brown and finally bursts into the fire that will consume it. They are the same rays that were previously ineffective. Concentration produced results. The mind must be brought under such complete control of the will that it can be manipulated like a searchlight, turned in this direction or that, or flung full upon some obscure subject and held steadily there till it illuminates every detail of it as the searchlight sends a dazzling ray through space and shows every rock and tree on a hillside far away through the darkness of the night. End of section 3